It's morning at NTV and our Kickstarter at exactly 8 a.m. Monday morning. Now, last Thursday, the European Parliament passed an emergency resolution by a large majority denouncing the consequences of oil mega projects in Uganda and in Tanzania, particularly two projects from French multinational Total Energies, Tilenga, and ECOP. The resolution referred to human rights violations, acts of intimidation, judicial harassment, and immense risks and impacts on local communities, the environment and the climate. Now, more than 400 wells are to be drilled from December 2022 onwards, including 132 in the protected natural area of Makshan Falls. Production from the Tilenga project alone is going to be 190,000 barrels per day. Together with another area operated by the Chinese oil giant Sinok will be exported to Tanzania through a 1,400 445 kilometer buried pipeline called the East African Crude Oil Pipeline, also known as ECOP. Now, it will be the longest heated pipeline in the world. Members of parliament are calling on the French oil and gas giant to postpone the launch of the massive ECO pipeline for a year and to protect human rights and the environment at large. Now, here to decipher these conversations, I am joined by Paul Tuebaze, who is a natural resource activist and he's going to be taking us through uh, the impact of this conversation. But also we do have uh, a litigator, Edison Karuhanga, who's an advocate for Kampala Associated Advocates. He's also going to be giving us the spectrum from the legal side, uh, the impact of this, if we respond to it positively or negatively. Good morning to you, Paul. Yeah, good morning, uh, viewers and uh, our colleagues on online platforms. Okay, and Elison, you're most welcome. Good morning to you. Good morning, how are you? Very good. And good morning to our viewers. Okay, so I want to first find out from uh, Paul, starting with you, the decision for the East uh, the European Union on the oil pipeline, does it stretch all the way back to colonialism and its continuous tendencies and grip on the African state, or does it actually hold any water to what they're recommending? I think uh, the first point to make here you could cannot easily differentiate whether this has traces of colonialism at this time or whether it is a major business or a global business war. But for me, what I see currently, when you read the statement in its own detail, you realize that there is quite a lot of mix-up. Uh, the statement raises a number of issues that are bundled together raises governance issues, political governance issues, mm -hmm. overstay of the regime in power, for example. It talks about human rights issues, raises issues of environmental governance, uh, brings human rights issues on board. So for me, it is, it, it is quite bundled together. There are quite a lot of issues for you to determine exactly what it is trying to address. Mm -hmm. And in my own understanding, uh, it, is, it has been prematurely uh, arrived at. I don't think there, there was a thorough uh, understanding of these issues before releasing such a uh, statement or such uh, resolution. Uh, uh, when you look at the, the continued dialogue we have had with the European Union, they were part of the whole process mm -hmm. right there from the beginning. Most of the member states have been the ones financing the sector. And even uh, when we had the launch here of the final investment decision, they were part. So they have been on board. So it, it becomes very hard. Everyone is wondering why they are making a U-turn at the time when we're expecting to be pulling out the resources. Okay, all right. Well, uh, then your submission definitely reminds me uh, of the legalities that came through to that decision. And uh, Ellison will be giving us a background of that. But we want to give you a spectrum of exactly what we're talking about. Edward Muhumaza did compile a story in this regard. Take a look. On Thursday, the European Parliament passed an advisory resolution that could scuttle development of the East African crude oil pipeline, citing human rights and environmental concerns. The motion also seeks to exert pressure on the French president, Emmanuel Macron's government, to arm twist Total Energies SE, the majority shareholder in the Uganda oil project, to raise the bar higher during the development of the pipeline. 
While the resolution is not binding on Uganda, experts on oil and gas think that this signifies a rift between Uganda and Brussels, which funds much of Uganda's development agenda. Paul Mwebaze, who heads an environmental governance organization, pro-biodiversity conservationists in Uganda, says he interacted with the EU representatives who visited before the motion in Brussels. We met people who already had an informed decision. You cannot say you come, you are four people, you are running in, in a, a few minutes, you go speak to about four people in the Albertan Rift, the pubs, and then you come and make such a resolution of this magnitude. For, for me, I think we needed to have had a very serious scrutiny of these issues before we arrive at that position. The resolution suggested suspending construction of the East African crude oil pipeline for a year and looking for an alternative route citing delayed compensation in host communities. At first we had with Uganda had looked at using the Kenyan route which was too costly but also uh, not viable for the project. Uh, when you look at suspending one year for the launch of the project, now for us as civil society, we look at the host communities. It means they are going back to other days. It means the resettlement cannot happen now and also compensation cannot be completed. Uh, me, I think the, the project, the oil projects in Uganda, should proceed, but we just need to concentrate on sorting the issues in that the sector is sustainably managed for the benefit of the people. President Museveni tweeted, if Total, who is the main shareholder in the oil and gas project, chooses to listen to the EU parliament, we shall find someone else to work with. Either way, we shall have our oil coming out by 2025. You see, it was, uh, I would say, sarcastic, because he knows all these decisions are grounded in the contracts. So he knows it may not be an easy thing for Total to just pull out. If it pulled out, we would still have them on on the basis of what they committed. While Total may not pull out of the deal due to contractual obligation, some think Europe could be sending communication to its big banks when Uganda inevitably goes borrowing. It is the president of Uganda who has been saying we cannot again donate to the West by exporting crude oil. Because for him, he had said we can't build a pipeline to export crude. We want to build a refinery to process oil from here. Again, those companies and the, 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 the West, they said, no, we don't want to give you money for a, 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 a refinery. They said, for us, we want to give you money for a pipeline to export crude. And the president had to accept. The government has accepted. Now, that's the reason why now, you see, there's no discussion about the refinery. The discussion is about the eco. So when you see the EU, who know that they, are, they have no powers to direct us, but they are speaking... They are telling their company, the, these companies from the West, they are telling the banks from the West that you see, for us we don't want ABCD. And for you, the government of Uganda, if you are going to convince those companies to be here, convince the banks from the West to give you money, I tell you, you will have to lower each and every expectation that you have. Dickens Kamujisha, the chief executive officer of Africa Institute for Energy Governance, AFIEGO, refers to other countries thinking the same oil politics may befall Uganda. That's what has been happening in the entire Africa where they are producing oil. Because the projects are huge. The, the, the Africa, whether it is the African Union, whether it is the East African community, they have no capacity to raise money on their own. Experts recommend dialogue between the parties to deal with the issues to avoid direct or indirect consequences. Edward Mohumza, NTV. Thank you so much, Edward Mohumza, for that compilation. Now we are joined by a uh, member of parliament, <laughs> Medad Segona, who is here to also deliberate on the same conversation. Good morning to you, Honorable. Very good morning to you, uh, Prisoner, and to my colleagues. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. And to our viewers out there. All right. Now, um, uh, turning to you, Ellison, in regards to what has been submitted by Paul uh, and the whole environmental protection, human rights, and environmental governance in that regard, what is the mandate of the European Union on meddling in this particular business as far as oil and uh, the business is concerned for Uganda? Thank you very much, Priscilla. The European Union is a, is a large organization. The, the policy organs of the European Union are the European Council and are the European Commission. The European Commission, after that vote was issued, uh, or before the vote was issued, 
the co one of the commissioners of the European Union, co European Commission, gave a statement to the EU Parliament explaining to them that um, the European position as put forward by the European missions in this country has always been that they work very hard to protect, they say, human rights, but they have also been working very closely with government. Uh, they have helped government to join the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. And I think, first of all, from a policy perspective, the policy organs of the U European Union, which is the European Council that consists of the heads of state and the states themselves, and the European Commission, which is the form, the form of the executive or the bureaucracy of the EU, have suddenly not come out against this project. What has, who has come out against this project? Uh, a group of European politicians in the European Parliament. So I think the first thing we need to clarify is that the resolution of the EU Parliament is not binding either on the European Commission, on the European Council, on member states of the European Union, on private companies, and on foreign countries. It was the expression of an opinion of political leaders in Europe. I think what is unfortunate about that opinion is that it is based almost entirely, if you listen to the speeches or on fiction. Only this weekend, one of the movers of the motion posted a photograph, posted a map of Uganda and Tanzania on his social, on, and East Africa on his social media handles to show us the rivers which ECO would go through, and we are literally underwater. There Tanga, for example, is a beach. Oh, it's, it's, uh, I know it's a port, but before it reaches the sea, and these rivers don't even cross, like, don't even cross borders. So the, the level of misinformation which the members of the European Parliament subjected the debate to was very surprising. I, mm. I actually became very proud of the Ugandan Parliament, have, having watched that discourse, because it was fiction upon fiction upon fiction. The Ugandan Parliament has had opportunity to discuss ECOP in the ECOP Special Provisions Act. And I think all sides of the political divide were represented in that debate. And if you look at the quality that came out, I'm sorry to say it was um, quite excellent from the Ugandan Parliament. I'm sorry to say on behalf of the European Parliament that I was thoroughly disappointed. There, there was fiction upon fiction. The number of people displaced, where the pipeline is going to pass, the emissions that are going to come out. And uh, it was also unfortunate because unlike many people, the EU, s and, and you can understand why the parliament passed the resolution that they did, the EU sent a delegation of MPs here before that motion was passed. And they came here, they sat, they went into the area, they sat with the environmentalists, they, that particular gentleman who posted it was here. I, I, I don't think he moved around in a canoe. So um, I think in fairness, the, on, on the one hand, the, the, the position of the EU Parliament as a political organ, uh, independent of the governance structures of the EU, and only able to legislate very specific matters under the treaties that establish the European Union, uh, needs to be distinguished from the overall position of the European Commission, which on that very day was communicated, I think, by a commissioner called Ferreira to the, to the members of the European Parliament, that uh, the EU is certainly not... Um, opposed to the project from an institutional perspective. Okay, thank you so much, Ellison. Uh, the European Council is independent of the resolution that was made on the floor of the European uh, Parliament. Now, you've also sung praises of the Parliament uh, and how they've actually handled this conversation. Uh, I do have Hodorebo smiling there. I don't know if that smile is in agreement mm -hmm. of what you have submitted or in disagreement because on their hand, especially from where he sits, uh, some of the issues that were raised, such as human rights violations and so forth, have been one of the things that them they have been voicing. And so I'll turn to Honorable Member of Parliament, Segona. In this regard, looking at the baseline and the presentations uh, from Ellison and also uh, from the subject matter thereof, is this the kind of intervention that you were looking for? Well, first of all, I'm like, like Ellison, I'm proud that he's uh, talking about the quality of Parliament in Uganda. I don't know if he has ever doubted the same. No. You know, Ellison, <laughs> Ellison comes from a family where his father was a member of parliament for some 10 years. And of course, he was one of our best legislators in this country. And uh, Ellison therefore knows the quality of parliament we have in Uganda is, is top notch. 
is excellent. I, 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 I'm surprised he was surprised. <laughs> I was surprised how On this particular was. subject, but <laughs> is where he you know, was you surprised. See, if we are good also, and you're saying they are bad, you should never compare the two of us. I, you know, if someone compares you with a bad one, then you are not good either. I withdraw the uh, comparison. But that said, yes, first I want to agree with him to an extent. It is not absolutely true that the European Parliament can be divorced entirely from the entire governance structure. Because you, if you understand how parliaments operate, parliament appropriates the budget that runs the executive arm of any institution or organization. To that extent, the resolution of the European Parliament may have a bearing or, is, or, or influence on how we relate the, with the European Union on this subject. I want to agree with him that, uh, one, to the extent that the players in this field are private entities, they are not bound by the resolution of the European Parliament. Two, as a sovereign nation, or two sovereign nations, Tanzania and Uganda, again, we are not bound. But that is at a theoretical level. If you are talking about how we finance our budgets, the contribution of the European Union, that's where I have reason to worry. If we had reorganized all our sectors of the economy, that we could be independent, I would not be worried, because I would say, well, away from oil, we OK. We don't need their money. And to me, that's my concern that uh, when they express that kind of opinion, and yet part of the budget that we, we rely on here is passed by the same people, I get a, a little concerned. Three, let's also look at the issues they are raising. First of all, it was erroneous on their part to give us direction or directives on how we're going to manage our oil. Mm. Ordinarily, we would even have the right to say we are not extracting this oil. We'll extract it and sell it in this form, including exporting it through the pipelines. That's entirely our business as a sovereign nation. And we cannot receive direction on this. We can receive opinion. And once we receive it as an opinion from a partner, we a duty bound to look at that opinion, examine it, verify the contents and the concerns raised. The issues of human rights transcend borders and boundaries. Therefore, if they are talking about environmental concerns and other human rights issues, as a government, we have a duty to look at those issues, and if anything is not right, we put it right. It is our duty. As development partners that we work with, if they could be of any help, of any assistance, of any value, for example, some of the environmental issues may require some funding to be sorted. If you're talking about resettlement, if you're talking about um, mitigation of environmental impact and we do not have the money, we may need them. But if we have alternative sources, as the president has always said, that we will not need them, then we have that absolute right to, to behave the same way. Some of our government officials have said, to hell with your money. Mm -hmm. As an officer of government, I cannot say that. I'm not in a position to do that. You're more diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I'm older than Elson, yeah. I have a duty to approach these issues differently. Uh, and because at the end of the day, it comes back onto my shoulders, you know, how to manage and how to run the economy with, with or without the support mm -hmm. of these uh, partners of ours. My considered view is that the language and tone could have been different. I don't want to entirely say that the content 
was false. I think our duty as government is to look at the text of their resolution and follow the entire debate and see where there may be concerns. Of course, you cannot divorce this uh, resolution and debate from what we have consistently heard in rumors that the, the Europeans and our other partners out there do not want us to excel. They want us to remain where we are, or even worse. For whatever reason, some have been stated to be mischievous. And I do not want to go into those uh, theories. Some say they want us to remain poor so that they continue feeding us as they export raw material. We export raw materials to them. We export cheap labor and so on and so forth. We're used as experiments. We have seen this in social media. I don't want to take it as the official position with the people we relate with. Okay. But we have a duty. One, to build our economies to strength so that we must stop being beggars. When the NRM government was coming in from the bush, you know what we came with? Uh, a self-sustaining economy. Close to four decades, we are not a quarter of that self-sustaining economy. Economy. We are not anywhere near. Somebody thinks by luck we have oil now, that will take us there. That's a different uh, argument altogether. But one thing you must know is that to build and enhance your capital, you need capital. Mm. The basic capital we need here, mm -hmm. here are the raw materials. Now we seem to have them. The next is the expertise. Do we have the expertise to do this job without the Europeans? Or without other people who may end up coming in and are more parasitic than the Europeans? We have not built sufficient capacity to do that. I have stated here before, even the way we run our economies and our politics. One day the president went to Algeria. I think the government had sponsored 14 students. 14 in oil and gas. And do you know the shock? They all came from one tribe. One tribe, and I insist, I want them to bring this, that list. You read the names. Now, that one will not help us enhance our capacity because there will be a group that will be fighting this. And it's not surprising, therefore, that you may see other people in Uganda siding with the, with the Europeans on this. So let's manage ourselves. Because of those uh, underlying Those underlying okay. issues. All right. Let's uh, sort let them me, yeah. and deal with the issue of corruption as well. Who uh, is signing these agreements? It's not out of this conversation. But uh, before we go any further, I'd like to get Paul's uh, opinion on this. Uh, Honorable has mentioned some things. He has talked about uh, the entities in which we're in bed with in regards to this oil production expected. Uh, for example, Total Energies is not bound to this resolution. He has also talked about the sovereignty also not being bound uh, to this uh, resolution that has been given. But in regards to government insisting on carrying on these works with the project, it's not the first time that we're seeing government, uh, you know, insisting on continuing on regardless of the influence of uh, foreign countries such as this. Now, what does this speak to you in terms of uh, you being a scientist and an activist in regards to environmental protection, among other things? I think what is key here is to begin to draw boundaries between issues of politics, issues of economics, and then the environmental science and climate change. It doesn't make sense for us to try to raise issues of corruption under the cocoon of climate change. For, for me, that's where I find uh, uh, the, the, the problem. If it is about environmental related issues, issues of climate change, noise control, pollution control, let's deal with those in their original form, the way they are. And then if it is about corruption, mismanagement of resources, human rights, we deal with them separately. By the moment we try to, to, to justify issues of pollution using examples of corruption, using examples of, of state inefficiency, then we are losing the point. 
And, and for me, that is where the problem is. We need to draw clear boundaries for us to be able to address each issue. So for you, in regard to this resolution, as the Honorable rightly stated, that they may not take it full, but it's a debate worth uh, you know, uh, taking note of and realizing that these are some truths that uh, back here in Uganda under this oil management, we need to actually address fully. So what are some of those issues yes, that need to actually be addressed? Yeah, of course it's true. We, we, we can't uh, uh, discard the whole position. The, some of these issues are actually available. They are there. There are issues of human rights. There are issues of environment. But most on the environment, they are still based on speculation. Because we have had, we have put in place quite a number of environmental gov governance tools for these projects. And the EU parliament is aware. And they have actually even participated looking at some of them. And, but the challenge is that we have not given an opportunity to even test them. So when you start stopping a project on the basis of what is likely to happen, for us from the SIA perspective, we don't know what you mean exactly, because we have already arranged the mitigation measures. We think there is, a pro there is a likely risk here, and this is how we would contain the risk in case it happened. But if you don't give me an opportunity to reach that stage and conclude and say, because of this fear, you shouldn't go ahead, then we can never proceed. So the approach for me would be to dialogue on the issues they are raising. And then, as, as Honorable said, we may need their advice on how to address some of these issues. Some of the advice is instrumental. It can be positive for us. And, and we see, we see, whatever doesn't work, we discard. But it is wrong to just say that because we have fears on this and this, let's stop the project or let's the project. Because that doesn't, that doesn't solve the problem. If you, I, I happened to be in the region, I think the whole of last week, speaking to the project affected persons, for them actually their position is very clear. They are saying the project is even delaying. They want to benefit as soon as possible to even compensate some of the few things they have lost as a result of giving out their land, mm -hmm. as a result of tampering with their livelihood. So for, for them now, the hope is about how soon should we have this project. So that some of us who have been suffering, having livelihood issues, can have, can benefit from the new opportunities that come along with the project. Now, when you come and say the project should stop because people are suffering, then you continue now to make them suffer. No, are likely to suffer. Okay. They suffer more. Yeah. <laughs> no, some you stop because they are likely to suffer. <laughs> when they. <laughs> now, speaking of consequences, Ellison, mm. is there any form of consequence that could come to us as a country in, in case uh, we don't really comply to this resolution? I'm not aware of any consequence that would come to us as a country. Um, but what I want to say b more, more broadly, w the, the resolution certainly is not binding on Uganda. Um, the European Union Parliament is not accountable to Uganda, and certainly Uganda is not accountable to the yeah. European Union Parliament. The members of the EU Parliament, though, did come here and did engage and did even go to the ground and did meet with the investors and did meet with the state and went back and uh, had understood nothing that they were told. That being said, I think on a wider perspective, it's important to also put the context that an oil project certainly raises environmental concerns. Uh, it has... and. In order to, to solve these sort of concerns, take, for example, the choice of the route. Um, I can be reminded, but it took Uganda almost five years to select a pipeline route, looking at about six options. And there was a very uncomfortable summit in Kampala here with the late President Magufuli and former President Kenyatta, where Uganda announced that it was going to go through, through Tanzania. And I don't think Kenya left that summit very happy. So the, 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 choice, the choice of the pipeline route was extensively studied. The environmental studies, after the environmental and social impact assessments were presented to NEMA for approval, and after NEMA looked at them, just to be extra careful, NEMA sought the assistance of the Norwegian Environmental Agency as well as the Dutch Environmental Agency to look at these studies and see if these studies meet international best practice. And they sent back a number of questions and a number of areas where they thought there were gaps, and people were told, to fill out these gaps. 
the, the, the impact of countries like Norway on our petroleum subsector, I think even in terms of even in terms of Parliament as well, mm -hmm. the, the amount of support that Parliament itself has a, at an institutional level to give oversight has sought to be able to understand these projects when they come to the House for debate. I think we have tried to seek cooperation f from the Europeans, from the Japanese, from the Chinese, from the Americans, and everyone, because the fact of the matter is that at the beginning of this process, we did not have the, the knowledge and capacity, mm -hmm. but we went out of our, and so the country has always been open to listen to advice, to ideas, and to learn. Uganda's journey to oil is a very long journey to decide whether we're going to have a refinery, to decide whether we're going to have a pipeline, to decide where the pipeline is going to go, to fight with companies for taxes, to carry ourselves along politically, to have people actually have, have oversight over this project. So I think that when you talk of the consequences that the Europeans are likely to visit on us, I think that there are some people who you just can't convince. And there are some people who can't listen to what you're saying. And there are some people who will never agree with you. Okay. And I think the members of the European Parliament who came here fit squarely within the bracket of the people who will just, whatever you say, they will you. just <laughs> never <laughs> agree with you. Okay. Uh, and, um, and so we have to look at it within within that context. Thank you, Elisod. Well, the reality of the matter is that no man is an island, especially in this all conversation. But as we continue, we're going to be taking a short break. When we return, uh, we're going to look at what's actually on ground and where this stands and then the legalities of it, the protection of the environment and, of course, the people who have been affected by this route. Uh, how are they being compensated from now henceforth? Watching Morning at NTV. You're still watching Morning at NTV now. Kick started today having an analysis of the European Union resolution, parliamentary resolution uh, to the East African crude oil pipeline and exactly where it is passing in their resolution. They're uncomfortable with the current mapped out route and they're saying that uh, perhaps works should be halted and then find an alternative route that is more environmental friendly and uh, among other things and human rights and so on and so forth. Uh, so I I'll come back to you, Paul, in regards to halting uh, of uh, the drilling works in the protected and sensitive ecosystems as well as the postponement of the pipeline for a year to study the feasibility of an alternative route that would preserve the environment and consider other projects best on renewable energy. First of all, the reality of the matter, from where I stand, is that even that alternative <laughs> route will still have issues, <laughs> environmental and otherwise, wouldn't it? You see, I, I, when I read and, and, uh, the, the document and they were saying the pipeline is passing through the Lake Victoria Basin, and you raised that as an issue, as an environmental issue, I began by thinking, how does, you know, how big is the area of influence of the project? When you say the Victoria Basin, oh, there are very many countries. So is that an issue saying that you delay the project because the pipeline is going to pass through the Lake Victoria Basin? Because the basin has very many countries. So where will you put it? Where would you find an alternative route that is not in the basin, that is not in Lake Victoria Basin? Uh, and, and for me, the challenge is we have worked with these partners. Defining the alternative routes right away from the beginning, as, as my colleague was saying, we had very many options. Over six, by the way. Studies were done, both the geotechnical, the environmental, and all those. And along, this, along the way, they were part of this. They were scrutinizing. And surprisingly, they were even, some of them, funding this work. We were submitting reports to them for scrutiny. They were advising, they were commenting, they were okaying. Now, environmental governance tools such as the CRS, the uh, EIS, the, all this was done with the environment. The Norwegians under the Oil for Development Program, as Honorable said, funded almost 60% uh, uh, of oil and gas work here in the country. And actually, we are using Norway as an example, as an example of good practices. 
We have delayed as a country to be able to study these things and act better. Now, after having through all that, working with you, all that, how you stop and make a U-turn and say, no, all we are doing was not right, mm -hmm. is, is what is actually... After going through six alternatives that you had on the table. Six uh, even then, look at the time we have taken. Why were these issues arisen the from decision, the beginning yeah. for them to be rectified there and then? Why do you raise issues in areas where you have even okayed? You, ra you start now saying, whatever I did with you is wrong. Okay. Is that what they are trying to say? All right. Uh, let me bring in uh, the legalities here. Honorable, in regards to that, uh, you're looking at uh, this being challenged uh, in so many ways. Uh, he says, and you all, all do agree, that you did have inclusion on table when all these considerations were being made. By the time we get to the final decision, uh, there's options on the table, and this was the best of them on the table. And so fr from this moment onwards, are we going to continue business as usual according to the plan that was already laid out? No, first of all, um, as Elson said, we've, had, we've come a long way. You know, this oil in Uganda was not discovered in the last 30 years or 40 years. <laughs> It was discovered way back in the 50s or even beyond. So we, we, we have come a long way trying to understand how best we can extract this oil and benefit from it as a country with minimal damage. Because you see, you cannot completely eradicate uh, damage. What you can do, one, is to minimize and to mitigate. We, did, we came up with a legal framework. And that was in the ninth parliament. I was happy to be part of the, that oil discussion. We came up with a policy framework. And as my colleagues say, yes, we've been working together with, 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 the, with our partners on, on, on this. One thing, I, like I did say, is to, I think the approach of government should be to say, yes, your concerns are noted and will be taken into account. I agree with, I think, with uh, Genome 7 when he says, halting is out of the way. We must proceed. And we must proceed anyway. We cannot, the concerns raised, but we can only move forward. Now, I would only be happy to look at their technical document, which formed the basis oh, of yeah, the resolution. Sure. And we would read that technical document word by word, letter by letter, to see where the concerns are coming from and if those concerns cannot be mitigated. Because the, you're not going to find an alternative which has no challenge at all. Which does not go through <laughs> environment. Yeah, it must <laughs> be. The I mean, we did as an environmental impact assessment of the whole project. Mm -hmm. If they want to, you know, to patch holes in, 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 in that assessment, we are happy to see where we went wrong and yes. rectify that. Mm -hmm. Because there's still time to do so. Yes, there is time. Yeah. There's time to do it. But, you know, stopping uh, the project where we have already invested heavily, our locally generated resources, borrowed money, mm. in, uh, as well as do donations. Land. We cannot. We have done some uh, uh, substantial amount of compensations. Mm. Uh, you know, the, the people where it's going to pass. You're not going to find a route where there are no people because Uganda does not have a desert. Yeah. Mm. Uh, sp speaking of which, uh, we've had some members of parliament who have been concerned, yes. especially when it comes to the compensation uh, about the fate of 118,000 people in particular. Mm. Uh, they've lost their property, they've lost their land yes, in terms of um, but, but, them but, but, being but, but rewarded. That, that, that figure also <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> it was made up on the floor. Of it, the it, it, to parliament. me, actually, it doesn't okay. matter. So what's the actual figure, Elisa? Um, the, remember the pipeline is a, um, what do you call it, is a transit corridor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like a very small road passing underground people's land. A large number of people will continue to occupy and use their land as the pipeline is passing. It's buried six feet underneath. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have to give way. So the, the households that will actually be permanently displaced where you'll have to lose your property, all of your property, 
and the use of that property are people who are, they are going to be terminals where they build I think heating I think heating stations above the above the ground okay. facilities. You're looking at uh, approximately 723 households. That's very good information, but I don't even mind, even if they are a million households. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that an issue that cannot be addressed? Mm -hmm. no. no. It can be addressed. We can do mitigation mm -hmm. we c by way of compensation. Because, you see, you're not going, there's no project you're going to have a mega project like this one without disrupting lives, mm -hmm. livelihood. We are going to resettle people. Those that are found in the route where we, where we, areas that we badly need, like those heating stations talking about, they have to be compensated. That's why for me I said, let's look at their resolution, look at the documents informing the resolution, and also look at our environmental impact assessment. Where I do not agree with my colleagues, where he says, uh, let's divorce this from the issues of corruption, the issues of how we manage the, or mismanage our economy. No, you see, this project needs the goodwill of literally every Ugandan mm -hmm. or every Tanzanian where the, uh, the, the, the project is going to pass. Now, if those underlying issues are not resolved, you have people ganging up. Take an example of Nigeria where their pipelines go through. People go, vandalize, and you find they have um, lit up the, the, the whole thing. Why? Because they say, look, this oil is ours. It comes from our land, it goes through our land, but we're not benefiting from it. So the issues that are being raised must be addressed. The issues raised by the members of parliament, by the way, notwithstanding the suspicion of how, of how Ugandans operate, exaggerate figures, uh, if, if, you know, must also be dealt with okay. because they're matters of concern mm -hmm. to us. Finally, on this, my view again, when you're dealing with somebody who is, uh, you, you see, we are not relying on oil alone. There are other areas that support our economy. And we have crippled ourselves, and I insist crippled ourselves, to the extent that we cannot finance our budget. Now, the person who pays the piper sets the tune. We, we've got to listen to them. Somebody was uh, cracked a joke when uh, this war began in, U in, in between Russia and Ukraine. Mm. And some young man on social media cracked a joke and said, no, let us resolve first of all to stop giving our aid to Russia. We stop feeding them, stop giving them ABCD. We withdraw our technical expertise. Now, you have no such things that you are giving to the other side for them to listen to you. They are giving you, they are literally feeding you why? Because you have mismanaged your lives, you can't feed yourselves, you can't pay your salaries, you need to borrow their money, you need their donations, it is it. However, we must have a, a stand that we cannot remain beggars forever. That's number one. And anything that takes us from the bracket of beggars, we must embrace and follow it up to the end, to the letter. So the project, in my view, is should it should go on. It should go on. The issues should be addressed. All right. We should also investigate. Otherwise, if we were giving them donations, we would also withhold our donations. Ellison, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, from a school of thought, the oil project is included into play. Uh, it will yield revenue to this country. And we're talking about an average of... Uh, Fifty dollars per barrel, and the World Bank records that with an estimated 1.38 billion uh, barrels coming in from our very own, uh, we're going to be earning a lot of money in this regard. So there's a whole question of when it's at the peak of production, um, the independence of again such other people or bodies or even countries uh, from influencing such things as the prices, the global prices, um, the legalities around this particular issue, trying to not exactly stop you, but trying to control Africa and maybe the East African region to still remain under their grip. Um, isn't this in the near future still going to open us up into you know, the supremacy of the rest of the world, the oil controllers for that matter? Certainly the the project has serious potential for Uganda. Uh, not just the revenues that you'll get, but you also open another route to, to the sea, and another trade route that didn't exist between uh, Uganda, and Uganda and Tanzania. 
and uh, build up a new very... Which we've been asking for because uh, through the Kenyan elections there's been that question of mm. what are the alternatives in case things go here mm. with uh, in the past Kenyan mm. elections. You have, you have a very big um, trade route that is already being created. I think the African Development Bank did a study along about 723 just new businesses in the last along the, 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 the pipeline corridor. Then you'll have a lot of um, Op synergies between Uganda and Tanzania as a result of this project. You have a, a, a fantastic new and serious porter, Tanga, that w I'm sure will not just export our oil. There's also the, Tanzania has also discovered gas and gas that can easily be transported to Uganda right now on the same, on, uh, they can use the pipeline route to create a gas pipeline from Tanzania to Uganda, which can really move a lot of our manufacturing prospects forward. So from the country's perspective, yes, there's serious opportunity. Will it affect our, is there a desire to control us? I think right now the way the world is, we no longer have, we can no longer say we have a homogeneous Europe that has that desire to control us. I think there are definitely certain aspects of colonial um, mentality that we saw in that resolution. There's no question about it. Big brother ordering around these small people who don't understand anything. Uh, someone deciding to speak from Brussels about what you should do here as if the people in the area that he's speaking for don't have a member of parliament. I, in fact, I saw one of them asking a member of parliament, how are you even a member of parliament in Uganda? Uh, so <laughs> I think the level of, um, of, of arrogance that we saw in that resolution is, is simply a, a hangover of an arrogance of maybe the last 100 years that um, certain people certain members of the European political elite may have had towards, um, towards Africans. And I think this will continue for a very long time, that level of arrogance. But I think the level of partnership between uh, Africa and Europe, uh, especially w and, 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 and the United States and uh, the Far East, I think the level of partnership is deepening, growing, and is also changing in many respects from policy perspective. So I think we shouldn't um, be too hung up Mm -hmm. on some people who have some old old, um, old hangovers. I, I, would, I would hesitate to say that there's a desire of, of Europe not to see us progress at a collective, political, and even institutional level. I think even many MPs who voted for that motion were voting on the information which was provided by the colleagues that, mm -hmm. th that came here. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of, I, I would not say that there's a lot of negativity that Europe has towards Africa. And I don't think it would be good to use this resolution to, 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 to stock anti-European sentiment within, within, within Uganda or Africa. But it is very clear that there are certain members of uh, the European Parliament who, who don't like us, but it's okay. All right. Mm -hmm. So the three of you do agree with we'll It not is certainly not business. okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in a minute, I'm going to allow each one of you to give us your closing remarks and the way forward uh, to this conversation and the expectations, really, of um, it coming into production, benefits of us, uh, not just for the country, but also for the region. I'll start with you, Paul, in your capacity. Yeah, thank you so much. For me, what I see as the immediate uh, option that brings uh, together either parties is to do a post-wrap audit, for example, so that, and on quite independent, we get an independent auditor to audit the processes of the wrap, how were people compensated, what was in the plan, was it done the way it was supposed to be, because when you speak to the project affected persons, as we, as we said earlier, the traces of connivance, the traces of, of dissatisfaction and evaluation still come. But when the European representatives, the, the representatives of the European Parliament came here, they never had sufficient time actually to listen, to engage, to dialogue with even key stakeholders. They came here. Uh, they were actually about four, five in number with journalists. They ran to, 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 to the field. They spoke to only a few people, which in my view some of them had been paraded. Uh, because we know actually, as, as, they are, as, as we said, there are some Ugandans mm -hmm. who already have issues. Okay. Issues of governance, corruption, oh. all that, and then it is possible that they can collaborate with those that are not... <laughs> All right, that's full stand. Uh, Honorable, your parting shots? 
Well, first of all, um, I, I, I do not want to agree that we can divorce those issues, governance issues, uh, from uh, the, the debate we are undertaking today. We must uh, look at the project wholesomely. All the issues raised, that's number one. Number two, and I, and I know how government operates. You can see these uh, statements that are so flashy coming out from uh, the executive or even from us in parliament. We, we also had a resolution also. But underground, yes, there should be discussions yeah. uh, to, to, to find a common uh, ground and common position. Okay. One thing should be clear is that we must go forward. And uh, I don't mean the go forward to which I belong, <laughs> but the country must move okay. forward. Address the concerns yes. raised, mm -hmm. address our uh, economic and governance inefficiencies, uh, uh, and, and respond to the concerns raised. Okay, all right, and indeed we are going to go forward. Uh, we will go up the hills and down the valleys, but at the end of the day we shall arrive at the final destination. Thank you so much for having been a part of our Kickstarter conversation and thereof our morning at NTV edition Monday. And uh, we wish you nothing but a blessed day.